So welcome all of you. Uh, in Krakow today we have a very snowy day. Yesterday it was almost minus 20 degrees here. Uh, today is uh, much better, but uh, I guess the uh, weather conditions are completely different than in India. Uh, so, uh, not um, uh, taking too much time for this introduction, I would like to start with presentation of a, a short movie. It's a six minutes long uh, movie prepared by the Museum of Warsaw Uprising, an institution uh, established in the year 2004 to uh, present and to uh, interpret the history of the Warsaw Uprising 1944 event due to which the capital city of Poland was almost entirely uh, destroyed. Uh, the name of the movie is The City of Ruins and it presents the cityscape of Warsaw as it was just after the liberalization, uh, liberation of Warsaw, sorry, uh, which happened on the 17th of January 1945. Actually, two days ago, we celebrated the 76th anniversary of liberation of uh, Warsaw. On that day, uh, the snowy January of 1945, the Red Army together with the uh, Polish army supervised by Soviets uh, entered the ruins of Warsaw. And on that day, uh, the city was liberated. Uh, on that day in Warsaw, there was less than 1000 people uh, who survived the destruction of the uh, city. The destruction that was an ongoing and planned process uh, that uh, was going on since uh, at least uh, September 1939. Uh, uh, just before the war, there was more than 1,350,000 inhabitants in Warsaw. So it was a relatively large city, maybe not the biggest city of Europe, but uh, still, let's say, one of the uh, big ones. And here we can see what happened after the war. Right now we can see the historic part of the city and at the front of us we can see the ruins of the royal castle in Warsaw. I'm going to comment the reconstruction of this place. As you can see, in 1945 there was no castle at all. It was uh, exploded. At first it was bombed and then exploded. And right now uh, we can see the uh, historic part of the so-called old city. In August 1944, it was a place of a very heavy fights uh, that were continued for more than one month. And uh, afterwards, uh, the entire place was simply demolished. And once again, uh, the ruins of a castle. And in the beginning, you can see also the ruins of the Royal uh, Cathedral in Warsaw also uh, totally uh, destroyed. So that's the oldest part of the city. The so-called old uh, town was established at the turn of the 13th and 14th century. And here is the main square of the old town. And we are right now moving uh, forward to the west part of the city. Uh, and uh, we can see already the uh, part of the city that was even more demolished. There are even no ruins. And uh, this part is called Muranov. Mm. Once again, the uh, old uh, town uh, main square, as you can see, uh, non-existing uh, in 1945. And in the back, you can see also some of the churches uh, and some of the historic buildings of this part of the city. And right now we are approaching the part of uh, uh, Warsaw, which is called Muranov. Uh, it was established in the 17th century. And what is important, uh, during the World War II, uh, German uh, administration decided to uh, turn this part of Warsaw into a Jewish ghetto. Uh, and uh, this part of the city was uh, the most destroyed uh, part of Warsaw after the war. Uh, in 1943, one year before the Warsaw Uprising, uh, 
when uh, Germans decided to um, close the ghetto and to kill all of the inhabitants uh, who still survive in, in the ghetto, uh, the last survivors decided to fight. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the ghetto uh, uprising uh, of 1943 uh, was a reason of a total demolition of this uh, part of the city. And this is the only one building that survived in Muranov after the war. The church, we will see uh, an image of this church later on. And here we are again approaching the Vistula River. As you can see, uh, all of the bridges were bombed. Uh, uh, right after the liberal, uh, right, right after the liberal uh, liberalization uh, of the city, uh, liberation of, of the city, uh, only the provisional bridges were installed. And uh, if, uh, uh, right now we can see the uh, old uh, city, the oldest part of the city uh, from the western side. Uh, again, we can see. Uh, the ruins of a castle in the backyard, and 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 you can see the conditions of uh, this place. Here are the gardens of the royal castle. I'm going to comment during my presentation. And right now we are approaching the so-called the uh, royal route, about uh, three kilometers long um, line of boulevards that links the old city uh, with the. Uh, with the uh, Uyazdov castle, the other uh, residency that exists in uh, Warsaw. Uh, so here we can see Powisla district and Karowa street. Uh, right now uh, we are approaching the uh, palace of the president of Poland. Uh, it is just next to this, uh, uh, to this road. Uh, in 1945, it was among the destroyed uh, buildings. And right now, uh, the camera goes south uh, towards uh, uh, Łazienki and, and uh, towards uh, Vilanov. Uh, during the war, the southern part of uh, Warsaw was uh, occupied by the German administration and the German army. And, uh, and this part of the city was uh, not uh, was not uh, so heavily destroyed. However, uh, as it was already said by uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Warsaw was, de was destroyed uh, in 85%. Uh, uh, so right now, uh, let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, here we can see the um, old uh, city of Warsaw as it is today. Uh, entirely reconstructed. Uh, after the war, after the end of the World War II, many European cities and many European countries were dealing with the problem of the reconstruction. It was a problem of the Soviet Union, it was a problem of Poland, uh, of uh, Germany, both Germany's uh, East and West, as well as it was a problem of, uh, uh, it was a problem of, uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, can you see my presentation right now? No. Uh, okay, so right now, I'm very sorry I, I started in the wrong way. I hope that uh, at the moment, uh, oh, uh, right now it should be okay. Uh, so here you can see the uh, old city of Warsaw as it is today. Uh, and as I said, uh, after the end of the war, uh, reconstruction was a problem of many European countries. Uh, Soviet Union, Poland, Germany, United Kingdom, uh, the Netherlands, uh, France, uh, Italy, among the others. And uh, in all of these countries, there were cities that were uh, partly or entirely destroyed. Any country uh, was going in a different direction. If you will go to London, you can see Bar Bar Barbican Art Center built in the historic district. Uh, that was not uh, reconstructed after the war. Uh, in case of Poland, uh, the uh, methodology of reconstruction uh, that was uh, developed after the war uh, was the one uh, that was uh, trying to reconstruct as much uh, as possible of the historic parts of the city. 
historic, I mean the ones that been developed before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so in general, uh, in 1945, architects responsible for the monument restoration of Warsaw, they thought that everything that is, uh, let's say, older than 100 years uh, should be reconstructed. And at that time, the approach towards the late 19th century and early 20th century architecture was not very positive. Uh, so in case of the other parts of the city, uh, restorers from Poland thought that we should go in some, let's say, new directions. I'm going to comment that later on. But in case of the historic city centers, we should uh, re uh, reconstruct as much as possible. And this is the case of Warsaw. Uh, once again, uh, Warsaw. Here you can see a cityscape of Warsaw uh, with the uh, reconstructed old town in the front, as well as with the new uh, uh, cityscape of Warsaw with skyscrapers in the uh, in the back. Uh, the city of Warsaw was established uh, in the very beginning of the 14th century, at the turn of the 13th and the 14th century, uh, as many cities in Poland. Uh, today, the population of Warsaw is a little bit uh, smaller than two millions. Uh, however, the metropolitan area of Warsaw is of about three million uh, people. So comparing to uh, your standards, it's maybe not the big city, but uh, comparing to European standards, it's uh, one of the biggest. Uh, beginnings of Warsaw in the 14th and the 15th century, let me to comment the history of the city. Uh, in the very beginnings of its history, it was a relatively small uh, medieval town comparing to other cities in Poland. It was not the big ones. Uh, at that time, it was located on the, uh, let's say, uh, in the borderlands between Poland, Teutonic Knight Order country, and Lithuania. And for many times, it was destroyed by some uh, wars, some uh, military attacks. Uh, what we can see right now is the etching presenting uh, Warsaw as it was in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, in the uh, end of the 14th century, Poland and Lithuania uh, decided to uh, go together. And that's the beginning of the personal union uh, between two countries. Uh, since end of the 14th century, we had the same king. Uh, at the end of the 16th century, uh, 1569, Poland and Lithuania established one state, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And uh, partly because of this decision, uh, another decision was taken to move the capital city of Poland and of this country, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, from Kraków to Warsaw. In Kraków, uh, we are still crying, uh, but for Warsaw, it was a very important uh, moment. Uh, the city development uh, started to boom and already in the middle of the 17th century, the panorama of Warsaw, it was not only a panorama of medieval city, but also of a row of palaces built along the so-called royal route. And here we can see this mid 17th century uh, conditions. And in here we can see also the 18th century plan of Warsaw. Uh, until 18th century, Warsaw have been developing along the Vistula River. Uh, in the 18th century, it started to grow also uh, more and more to the west, further away from the, uh, from the Vistula River embankment. At that time, there were more and more of the uh, Baroque palaces uh, built uh, all over the uh, city of Warsaw uh, for the king, but also for the aristocracy. And uh, this is the plan in, uh, until today in many places of uh, Warsaw is uh, visible and which shapes the, which determines the development of the very city center of, uh, of Warsaw. Uh, the crucial moment for the city development happened at the end of the uh, 19th century. Already by the end of the 18th century, the city of Warsaw uh, was of about 200,000 inhabitants. But uh, at the end of the 19th century, there was about seven, 800,000 people living in the city. So as you can see, Industrial Revolution pushed the uh, city development 
uh, very fast uh, forward. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, the city saw another boom uh, in its development history. And uh, just before the World War II, the population of Warsaw reached about 1,350,000 inhabitants. Uh, what is very important is to say that uh, since the very beginning, it was the multicultural city, multi-ethnic city, multi-religious uh, city, uh, especially Jewish population was um, very visible and strongly represented uh, in the city of Warsaw. Uh, before the war, uh, about 30% of inhabitants of Warsaw represented the Jewish community. Uh, the northern part of the city was the Jewish uh, district, but uh, Jews, uh, Warsaw Jews, they've been all over the city representing uh, various uh, social groups, uh, various uh, professions. Uh, they played extremely important role in the uh, development of the uh, city of uh, Warsaw. So that's the plan of Warsaw of 1920s. And uh, that's the time when uh, Warsaw is, uh, let's say, growing into a kind of a European uh, metropolia. Uh, this uh, golden era of 1920s and 30s, especially 1930s, was a, a very uh, good time for Warsaw, uh, ended in September 1939. And uh, what should be said is that the destruction of the city, it was a tragedy uh, that was continued for almost five years, uh, more than five years. And uh, there were like few very important moments for this destruction. It started already in September 1939. Uh, Nazi Germany attacked, uh, attacked Poland on the 1st September 1939. Uh, Warsaw was uh, fighting until the end of September, uh, so almost one month, and was bombed several times. And here we can see a photo taken on 17th of September 1939, a very symbolic day and moment for uh, Poland. On that, on that day, not only uh, Nazis been attacking Poland, but also Soviet Union decided to attack um, uh, our country. And the same day, the royal castle in Warsaw was bombed and uh, put on fire. Uh, it wasn't destroyed yet. It was destroyed on 1944, but uh, was uh, heavily, uh, heavily, um, partly damaged uh, on that uh, on that day and on that time. Uh, another very important moment. Uh, so in September 1939, a uh, large part of the city of Warsaw was already destroyed because of the heavy bombardments. N another important moment of the city destruction happened in 1942 and 1943. In 1942, uh, Nazis decided to launch the uh, extermination of the Jewish population. Uh, the Jewish ghetto was established in 1914, and uh, in 1942, uh, German administration decided to uh, kill all of the Jews living in Warsaw, to send them to extermination camp in Treblinka. And uh, at the end of, uh, let's say, uh, destruction of, of the ghetto, uh, the last survivors decided to fight against Germans. The uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising uh, was launched in uh, April 1943. And here uh, in the bottom, we can see the remains of the great uh, synagogue uh, of Warsaw. <clears throat> the explosion of this synagogue on the 6th, uh, 16th, 16th May 1943 meant the end of uh, uprising and actually the end of uh, existence of the Jewish population in, uh, in Warsaw. And uh, finally, uh, the last, uh, let's say, uh, part of uh, the destruction happened a year after. Uh, on the 1st of August 1944, the uh, Polish underground army uh, decided to launch the uprising, uh, hoping to get control over the city before the Red Army will enter. Uh, the Polish uh, underground, the so-called Land Army, controlled by the Polish government in exile in London, 
uh, decided to fight to get control over the city and uh, welcome the Soviets uh, coming to the city from the other side of the river. Uh, the plan failed, uh, Soviets decided to stop and uh, finally the land army was fighting in Warsaw for almost two uh, months. Uh, about 200,000 of uh, civilians were killed during the Warsaw Uprising and uh, the rest of the city was left in ruins. So uh, what we've seen in the movie, in this animation, presented the Warsaw as it was right after the total uh, destruction. Uh, and maybe one more information, when the uprising ended uh, in October 1944, the uh, Nazis, they still kept control over the city until the 17th of January. And for more than three months, they've been uh, permanently destroying uh, block by block uh, the rest of the city that survived. About 30% of the city that survived uh, was destroyed in that three months of time. Uh, at the very end, that was the result. Uh, less than 1,000 people left uh, in this, in the, uh, let's say, uh, western part of the city, and uh, most of the city was left in ruins. In here we can see the Muranov district. Uh, during the war, this very part of the city was turned into a Jewish ghetto, and after the war it was covered with about three meter high, three up to four meter high uh, layer of uh, of ruins, of rubbish, of bricks, uh, demolished uh, tenement houses uh, were laid down over there. It was actually the great uh, cemetery because thousands of people have been killed uh, in this place um, as well. Uh, and here we can see the map of uh, the plan of uh, destructions in Warsaw. It was estimated that in 1945, about 84% of the so-called left bank of Vistula cityscape was in ruins. Uh, the main part of uh, Warsaw is located on the western bank of uh, Vistula River, but there is also a part, so-called Praga, located on the right embankment. Uh, this part of the city was not uh, destroyed or only partly destroyed. Uh, but the most important part, the one on the uh, West Bank, was uh, destroyed, left in ruins in 84%. Uh, when the city was liberated by uh, Red Army, less than one people survived. And what is important, uh, estimation says that uh, between 600,000 up to 800,000 inhabitants of pre-war Warsaw were killed. Uh, and uh, among uh, these who have been killed, uh, almost entire uh, pre-war Jewish population was exterminated, either during the uh, Holocaust uh, in the uh, death camp in Treblinka or uh, during the uh, Warsaw Ghetto uprising. So as you can see, the history of destruction of Warsaw is quite complicated. There are some several chapters and uh, here is the result. Uh, and uh, maybe a few photos. Uh, here are some photos uh, taken by American photographer, uh, Henry Cobb. He visited Warsaw in 1947 uh, to take the uh, photo footage for Life uh, magazine. And uh, here are these uh, photos presenting the uh, state of uh, the city. Uh, two years after uh, it was uh, demolished. And here we can see the old part uh, of the city. And in the top, uh, you can see the uh, Prudential office building. It was the first, let's say, skyscraper, pseudo skyscraper uh, built in Warsaw in the 30s. I already presented you the photo of this building when it was uh, exploded. Uh, and here is the statue of um, uh, Kilinski, a very important insurgent uh, of the 18th century. Uh, in the backyard, you can see one of the historic palaces uh, totally uh, destroyed. And uh, here is the uh, comparison of Warsaw, uh, the aerial photo uh, from before the war. As you can see, Warsaw was a vast, 
it, it was a very densely uh, populated and very densely urbanized uh, city. Uh, and it was actually part of the uh, reasons, or, or one of the reasons of uh, destruction. Uh, when the fire came, it was taking uh, the entire blocks. So here we can see the same part of the city uh, before and right after the uh, right after the war. Uh, what is important uh, when the city of Warsaw was liberated, there was some kind of uh, optimism. Uh, however, we lost. However, we uh, don't have this city anymore. However, it is a great. Uh, great uh, cemetery today, uh, we will reconstruct the city. That was the answer of uh, Polish society, but also of the Polish government. And a uh, few weeks after the liberation, uh, the decision was taken to establish a special bureau, a special office for the capital city reconstruction. Here we can see an image of the architects who uh, used to work in this uh, big uh, architectural company. There were like a few hundreds of them working for the capital city reconstruction. And until, let's say, 1960, they were running the permanent reconstruction of the uh, city uh, space. In the back, you can see the plan of uh, Warsaw. And here we can see uh, Mr. Roman Piotrowski, uh, before the war, during the 1930s, um, he was a communist activist, uh, being a member of the Polish Communist Party, uh, illegal at that time. But what is uh, more important, he was also a, a modernist architect, very inspired by uh, personalities like Le Corbusier, uh, very interested in the modern architecture. He was also an author of some iconic modern buildings in Poland, uh, in Gdynia city, for, for instance. Uh, during the war, uh, he became a member of the first, let's say, communist government, or, or let's say pre-government established in Poland uh, by the uh, communists under uh, supervision of the Soviet Union in 1943 and 1944. And uh, he became the chief of this office of the capital city reconstruction uh, in the 1945. So he was the one who grouped, uh, who grouped uh, the company responsible for the reconstruction. And until 1956, he was, the, he was among the top leaders of the communist Poland, because after the war, Poland was uh, formed uh, into a, one of the states of the Eastern Bloc, one of the close allies of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, I'm not going to comment his political activity. Uh, it's a separate uh, topic uh, for a separate uh, uh, meeting. But what I want to say is that uh, he was coming from, let's say, modernist uh, environment, from the modernist uh, part of the European architects and uh, uh, people like him representing uh, the graduates of mainly Warsaw uh, University of Technology, a very pro-modern school of architecture. Uh, they were responsible for the methodology of reconstruction. Uh, in general, uh, in 1945, there was a, a very big debate how to reconstruct the city. And here you can see one of the most radical projects prepared for Warsaw. Uh, due to this project, Warsaw should be redeveloped as a modern, uh, car-oriented, uh, American-style uh, city. Uh, this very project was prepared by uh, Maciej Nowicki, uh, better known as a Matthew Nowicki. In 1945, uh, Polish government decided to send him to US. He represented Poland uh, during the discussion about the building of United Nations in New York. And uh, finally, he decided to stay, stay in the United States. Uh, in the year 1949 and 1950, he was uh, collaborating with the uh, government of India, uh, being responsible for the first uh, urban project of uh, Chandigarh. Coming back from Chandigarh to Europe, he died in the airplane crash. And that's how Chandigarh project was later on uh, 
proposed by Le Corbusier. Uh, somebody had to take the work of Novitsky and it was, it was Le Corbusier. Uh, so this is, let's say, a small India chapter of this whole uh, story of Warsaw. But here we can see um, a Schwarz plan of Warsaw as it was before the war. As I told you, a very densely urbanized and very densely populated city. And on the right hand side, we can see a project developed in the early 50s. Uh, the people like Piotrowski, the chief architect uh, of the first years of reconstruction, they were very, uh, their approach to the pre war Warsaw was very negative one. So they thought that the city was badly urbanized. It's an effect of uh, uh, over urbanization. And right now there is a chance to make this city much better, to uh, de demolish uh, finally the back houses of the tenement house, uh, to not rebuild um, the tenement house in some part of the city at all. Uh, let's make this city modern one, however, uh, let's uh, take also uh, a kind of a peculiar approach towards the most symbolic and most historic part of the city. In the north, in the uh, top part of these uh, both plans, you can see the historic part of Warsaw, uh, the old town, and uh, the so-called royal route. Uh, this part of the city was decided to be. Uh, reconstructed, renovated in a separate way with one-to-one um, -one reconstruction of uh, majority of the buildings located there. Uh, in this very image, we can see the Royal Route. Um, it's a 17th and 18th century uh, urban uh, development uh, with many uh, Baroque, mainly uh, palaces, but also with plenty of tenement houses. And uh, in the top, we can see the old uh, town, this uh, 14th century uh, development. And here is this old town uh, built uh, uh, in the beginning of the 14th century, uh, typical, uh, at least in Central Europe, uh, typical urban uh, plan with the very regular square in the center, 100 meter for 100 meter, and orthogonal net of the streets. Uh, to the south of the city, we can see the castle. Uh, the first part of the castle was built in the uh, medieval era, but uh, the castle was uh, totally redeveloped and, and extended in the 17th and 18th uh, century. So this part of the city was decided to be reconstructed uh, almost one to one as it was before the war. Uh, the people standing behind reconstruction of the historic part of the city uh, were mainly uh, from the same um, environment and majority of architects responsible for the city reconstruction. And here we can see Jan Zachvatovich uh, before the war uh, he was a, a professor of the University of Technology in Warsaw, uh, responsible for history of architecture, uh, history of urban planning. Uh, already before the war, he was uh, dealing with the problems of renovation of monuments. And uh, being a very strong personality, he pushed uh, the idea of reconstruction of the historic part of the city into this one-to-one -one uh, reconstruction. Next to him, we can see Stanisław Florenc, uh, another very important figure, a museologist and art historian. Uh, he was the one uh, who already during the, uh, they both, during the war already they started to uh, take some measurements and photos of the uh, destroyed city and they were preparing the process of reconstruction uh, to be started after the war. They both survived the war. And uh, in 1945, the project of their life uh, was launched. Uh, Lawrence was responsible for recollecting the National Museum of Warsaw and in general for the inventorization of uh, what survived. Uh, and uh, Zachvatovich was responsible for uh, planning and for uh, designing the uh, particular buildings. 
so here we can see the old town just after the war and uh, at the end of the 1950s when most of their uh, task most of their uh, job was already uh, was already done uh, uh, what is important, uh, mainly from the point of view of the monument restorers, some of the techniques uh, used for the construction of these buildings uh, were impossible to be used again. Uh, instead of uh, calc, they were using cement. Uh, in some parts, they've been using reinforced concrete cement to put the ceilings in the buildings. They also changed a little bit the interiors of the buildings. Uh, so uh, it is maybe not one to one reconstruction, but let's say 85% one to one uh, reconstruction. Uh, another important problem was the uh, plaster. Uh, they were using the cement plaster, and in some cases, they were allowing the modern decorations to be put on the uh, building. Uh, I should also say that reconstruction uh, of the historic city, uh, it was not a specific problem of the post-World War II times. Uh, as you might have heard, Poland was quite strongly destroyed already during the World War I, uh, 1914 and 1918. There were some cities totally erased uh, from, the, from the ground during the World War I in Poland. And this was the case of the city of Kalisz. Uh, it's a small city located some 250 kilometers west of Warsaw. In 1914, it was heavily bombed by Germans. Uh, and uh, during the 20s and 30s, uh, the city was reconstructed. So uh, there was some, let's say, experience in Poland dedicated to reconstruction from the interwar period. Kalisz was not the only city like that. But after the World War II, the problem was of a completely different scale. Uh, there are some estimations saying that uh, more than 140 cities in Poland were destroyed uh, to a different uh, extent, of course. And uh, the technology and methodology implemented in Warsaw was like a pattern uh, to be uh, to be followed uh, in a, uh, some other uh, places and cities. Uh, concerning the iconography used for the uh, reconstruction, the very important one uh, was a set of the paintings uh, presenting uh, the city of Warsaw as it was in 1770s. Uh, it was a set of the paintings uh, prepared by a Venetian uh, painter, Bernardo Bellotto, uh, called Canaletto. He was um, a famous, at his times, painter responsible for vedutas. He was painting the cities, uh, various European cities, like Venice, uh, Dresden, among the others. And in 1770s, he was invited by the Polish king Stanislaw August Poniatowski, the last Polish king, to uh, picture, uh, to uh, prepare a set of pictures presenting the uh, city of Warsaw. So uh, the idea of authors of reconstruction of Warsaw was to uh, give the <clears throat> uh, Warsaw uh, reconstructed just as it was uh, at the end of the 18th century. So here we can see the uh, Royal Castle uh, courtyard, Royal Castle uh, Square, let's say, and we can see a view towards the Royal Route, and uh, we can see uh, some of the buildings that uh, were not exactly the same uh, before the war, but after the war, they were reconstructed to present this very image, iconic image of uh, Warsaw painted by Bernardo Bellotto, uh, Nicanaletto. Uh, so here is again on the left hand side the royal route and on the right hand side the uh, Krasinski family uh, castle. And some more of Canalettos, uh, he prepared like uh, almost 30 different paintings, uh, 30 different vedutas uh, presenting uh, Warsaw. Uh, here are some more. 
uh, they all survived. This is very important information. And finally, his masterpiece, the panorama of Warsaw from the uh, eastern embankment, from Praga embankment uh, of the Vistula River. So uh, uh, the idea was to rebuild this very image, uh, to rebuild this very panorama, to rebuild this very cityscape with the towers, uh, with the historic buildings as they were uh, in the end of the 18th century. Uh, these modern architects, uh, they were not so very satisfied with the result of the urbanization of the late 19th century. So, in fact, uh, they were um, uh, quite uh, uh, happy with the fact that they can build the city much better as it was before the war, uh, as well as to uh, keep this historic image uh, somehow frozen. Uh, that was the uh, methodology. And uh, in here we can see that one of the chambers of the royal uh, castle in Warsaw, uh, the one dedicated to Canaletto. If you will come to Warsaw, uh, please visit this place and there you will, you will be able to see uh, most of the paintings of uh, Canaletto uh, dedicated to Warsaw. Um, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, this uh, late 19th century uh, architecture was not uh, the one uh, that uh, these modern architects were very interested to. So in some cases, they decided to not rebuild the buildings as they were before the war, and rather to uh, come back uh, to the stage of the early 19th century, late 18th century, so, for instance, in here we can see a southern part of the Royal Route, the uh, Nowy Świat Street. And uh, what is important, in the 1930s, the buildings there, most of them were of about five, sometimes even six stories. But today they are just three story high, because they were like that uh, in the end of the 18th and in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, the, let's say, uh, biggest attention was uh, put on the uh, iconic buildings, for instance, churches. However, Poland was a communist state, but in the first post-war years, there was, let's say, uh, agreement that we should rebuild, we should reconstruct the um, Roman Catholic churches inside of the city of Warsaw. For instance, uh, here we can see the St. Alexander's Church, and uh, again, at the end of the 19th century, this church was extended. Uh, during the reconstruction, idea was uh, the decision was taken to rebuild it as it was uh, in its very beginnings. And uh, maybe one information this time for uh, His Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Poland, uh, this very church was reconstructed by Krakowian-based architect, whose name was Adolf Krzyszko Bohus. And uh, the embassy of Poland uh, in New Delhi is designed by his student and uh, his um, assistant, um, Professor Witold Censkiewicz. Uh, so uh, maybe one more a small India-Poland uh, connection. Uh, and here is the result. Uh, the roof tails, uh, the shape of the windows, as well as ornations of the buildings were uh, designed in a way to make it as close uh, to the pre-war uh, condition as it was. And here we can see the uh, main square of the old uh, town of uh, Warsaw with the mermaid uh, statue. Mermaid is a, a symbol of, uh, of Warsaw. Uh, and uh, maybe a few more words about controversies dedicated to the methodology. In here, we can see the uh, Cathedral of Warsaw, totally destroyed. On the left-hand side, we can see the neo-Gothic facade, uh, 1830s neo-Gothic facade of this Gothic building. Uh, after the war, uh, the decision was taken to not reconstruct this 19th century neo-Gothic facade. There were some various ideas how to uh, make it. And finally, Jan Zachwatowicz decided to um, design some kind of a fantasy about how this building could look like in the 14th or 15th century. There was no uh, good icon uh, iconography for that, but 
uh, it was a kind of a, a strategical decision what to do with the 19th century architecture. At that time, architects responsible for the reconstruction, they were not so very satisfied with uh, that. And uh, here we can see one more church. The very important problem was what to do with the interior. Uh, in some cases, uh, there was iconography or even some uh, art pieces to uh, rise it as it was before the war. In many cases, the idea was to give the space for the modern art. So this is the uh, case of St. Martin's Church, a very close uh, one uh, to the cathedral. Uh, they are located next to each other, as well as interior of, uh, interior of uh, St. Casimir uh, Church. Uh, right now we are in the center of the so-called new city, except of the old city, there is also a new city. Uh, it was established in the beginning of the 15th century. Uh, and uh, in the very center of this new city, there is this beautiful Baroque church, late 17th century church, totally demolished during the war and after the war uh, reconstructed, following one of the Canaletto's painting. And uh, inside, uh, there is the modern installation. And here are some ornations, sgraffitos or mural paintings. Uh, in here we can see the, all, the, the new city uh, of Warsaw and uh, the murals painted by Zofia Artymowska. There was a whole group of decorators uh, invited to work with this project. In some, case, in some cases they were uh, preparing almost one-to-one -one reconstructions of um, ornations. In some cases they were using a methodology due to which they were uh, trying to uh, somehow go along the form of the uh, pre-war uh, ornations, but to uh, set up some new modern uh, or modernized, let's call it this way, uh, compositions. In some cases, uh, they were uh, open uh, today, let's say, fantasy. On the right-hand side, you can see like a completely new composition put on the uh, reconstructed house. Uh, so this is more or less the methodology of the reconstruction of the old part, oldest parts of the uh, city of Warsaw. But I would also say that uh, this reconstruction was run in a very specific uh, political condition. Poland was a part of the Eastern Bloc, and here we can see the leader of Poland, his name was Bolesław Bierut, uh, together with uh, Joseph Stalin, the big brother from Moscow, uh, since late 1940s, Polish economy, Polish politics was more and more uh, connected to, let's say, Soviet pattern. At the end of the 1940s, Poland implemented the so-called Six Years Plan, a big plan for a strategic development uh, of the country connected with uh, fast development of heavy industry. Uh, in general, the reconstruction of Warsaw was a very important element of this six years plan, and uh, some parts of reconstruction were planned to be finished uh, at the end of the six years plan. So 1954 was a very important day for many buildings in Warsaw. And here we can see a panorama of uh, reconstructed Warsaw as it was presented in uh, one of the new, let's say, textbooks about uh, urban planning. Uh, it was a book by Edmund Goldsamt. Inside, you can find this very beautiful sketch. In the uh, front, we can see reconstructed historical part of Warsaw, but in the backyard, you can see a completely new city uh, with uh, some new uh, modern skyscrapers, like this very one, the so-called Palace of Culture and Science, uh, the tallest building in Poland for many years, uh, actually almost until today, it was last year, where for the very first time, uh, Palace of Culture was taken over by some new skyscraper, which is right now under construction in Warsaw. And uh, uh, it was a very important uh, political project on the propaganda level, very important. It was designed by exactly the same architect uh, who was responsible for the most prestigious buildings in Moscow, like uh, Womonosov University uh, 
building, Lev Rudniew, that was the name of the uh, designer who uh, was responsible for this very uh, for this very building. We are still very close from the city center. We are still uh, in the heart of the demolished uh, Warsaw, but we are right now in the part of the city that was urbanized in the 19th century. And in here, the idea was to not uh, rise again uh, this 19th century architecture, rather to fill the space uh, with the modern uh, type of urban planning and the skyscraper as a kind of a post uh, and the kind of a, a dominant uh, building for the uh, whole metropolia uh, was very welcome. Of course, uh, this very building was also filled uh, with a very specific uh, aesthetics. Uh, already during the 1930s, Soviet Union implemented uh, a kind of an aesthetics a style uh, propaganda oriented uh, style entitled uh, socialist realism and uh, 1949 uh, Polish authorities Polish communist government authorities decided to implement uh, so socialist realism also in the Polish uh, architecture all of the architects were obliged to follow this idea and the palace of culture uh, in Warsaw was to a certain extent the kind of a synthesis of various historical buildings from all over Poland. So uh, in the bottom, you can see the cloth hall, uh, Renaissance decorations of the cloth hall in Krakow. Uh, I can see this building from the window uh, right now. Uh, in the middle, you can see the uh, Wazienki Palace, uh, the neoclassicist 18th century uh, palace in Warsaw, and in the top you can see the town hall of the city of Zamość, 16th century Renaissance um, building. And uh, to a certain extent, you can see a traces of these historical buildings used as a um, pattern of the so-called national form, because the socialist realism was, so, uh, was supposed to be a socialist in content. Nobody knows what it actually meant, but it was also national in form. And national form was a different one in the East Germany, different one in Czechoslovakia, a different one in the Soviet Union, in various parts of the Soviet Union, and different one in Poland. Uh, in Poland, it was mainly uh, Renaissance and classicism, uh, 16th and 18th century architecture that was used to establish a kind of a style. Uh, very old fashioned already these days word was used to uh, develop the uh, to develop the uh, aesthetics of the building. Uh, I will uh, consume still uh, about uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes to finish my presentation. Sorry for extend, extending that, but I don't want to miss some very important elements. Uh, here we can see uh, leading architects responsible for the reconstruction of Warsaw. I told you already about Mr. Piotrowski, uh, the one on the right uh, part of the uh, photo on the left hand side, Mr. Sigalin, uh, who was a chief architect of the city in the 50s, and he was the one responsible for the new uh, developments, new estates, new uh, quarters. Uh, so uh, he was the one uh, standing behind the urban plan of the city with this skyscraper, but also uh, he was the one standing behind such ideas as uh, so-called uh, VZ Road, West uh, East West Road. Um, uh, it, it's a very modern junction uh, linking the bridge over the Vistula River uh, with a tunnel that goes underneath the some part of the old city of Warsaw. So uh, it was a very modern project, uh, however, still uh, covered with this costume, this uh, socialist, realist, Stalinist costume. Um, uh, outside of the old part of the city, there were these new es uh, establishments and they were following this, let's say, Soviet pattern of the early 50s. Uh, you can find this architecture in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Kiev, in uh, East Berlin, uh, among some other places in the world, and Warsaw is among uh, the best 
uh, of the best of socialist realism uh, as well. Here we can see the so-called uh, constitution square. Uh, so that's the modern part of the reconstructed Warsaw. Before we've seen the old part and right now that's the modern part. And uh, here we can see the Muranov estate. Uh, we already have seen this church uh, on the image. Uh, as you can see, this is the most demolished part of uh, Warsaw, the former Jewish ghetto territory. Uh, there was a big discussion what to do with this place. Uh, some uh, people said that it would be should left abandoned uh, as a ruin, but the idea, uh, the decision was taken to reconstruct it as a housing estate and uh, make it a kind of a triumph, <clears throat> a kind of a triumph over the uh, Nazism, like a, a phoenix from the ashes, Muranov should be rise uh, back again. Uh, inside of this uh, uh, district, uh, in the very heart of this district, uh, there is a statue of the ghetto heroes. And next to it right now, there is also the Museum of the History of the Polish Jews. If only you will come to Warsaw, I would strongly recommend you to visit this very place. And uh, one again, image of Muranov from the time of the reconstruction and the final result. Uh, uh, there were also some discussions concerning what to do with some historic buildings that actually did not fit the function already before the war. Uh, th this was the case of the uh, Great Theater, Grand Theater and National, National Opera Building. Um, the building was designed in the beginning of the 19th century, but was simply too small for the city of Warsaw. After the war, the decision was taken to make the uh, already existing theater as a kind of a lobby. Actually, it was a ruin. So uh, to make the shape of the former theater uh, as a kind of a lobby of a new theater and to build the really big theater in the back. When it was open for a short period of time, it was the biggest opera building in the world. Uh, soon after the Metropolitan Opera in New York was open and it was the biggest, but for a short time, uh, Warsaw was the uh, primary uh, in this race. So that's the uh, night, early 19th century building of the theater. Uh, we can see the front of this building uh, renovated or uh, reconstructed. And the back of this theater, there's the new architecture built in the way to fit the image of the neoclassical uh, building. And uh, one more, uh, discussion which is continued until today uh, is dedicated to the so-called Saski Palace or the Saxon Palace. It's a um, Baroque palace built in the 18th century, then totally uh, reconstructed in the early 19th century or built again in the 19th century. Uh, what is important, uh, at the end of the war, this palace did not exist at all, it was entirely demolished only a small part of this building, the one that housed the unknown soldier grave. This grave was uh, put there, uh, was uh, inaugurated there in the 1920s. Only this very part, Germans decided to uh, kept. And uh, this is the <clears throat> place uh, today. Uh, uh, still, uh, uh, how to say, surrounded by the Baroque Garden, uh, Saski Garden, but uh, the decision was taken to keep it uh, as it was in uh, the moment of the, uh, of the end of the war. And from time to time, we have discussion in Warsaw if it should be reconstructed or, or not. Uh, until today, it is left uh, as it was after the war, being a kind of a signal of um, how this city actually uh, looked like in the year 1945. Uh, the first chapter of uh, city uh, reconstruction uh, ended in the mid 50s. And what is important at that time, Joseph Stalin died 1953. And soon after uh, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the next leader of the Soviet Union decided to uh, let's say, uh, 
1956, uh, there was his famous speech by Khrushchev about the cult of personality. Uh, Stalin was, let's say, uh, pushed away from the uh, statue, uh, was not the main symbol of the Soviet Union uh, anymore. He was named uh, as, a, uh, as a criminal, uh, actually. And uh, after 56, uh, there was a big discussion all over the uh, Eastern Bloc what to do with the socialist realism. In Poland, socialist realism as the national aesthetics was almost immediately uh, left away, left abandoned. Nobody was following these aesthetics anymore. And uh, since late 1950s, Polish architecture was uh, approaching the modern uh, architecture, uh, following the mainly Western patterns. And in here, we can see the same street, Marszałkowska Street. Uh, on the top, you can see the Western, let's say, part of this uh, street with Palace of Culture. In the bottom, you can see the Eastern part of the street with the uh, modern uh, development, the so-called Eastern Wall. So this is uh, just to present you how the methodology of the city uh, renovation and reconstruction was uh, changing with the time, uh, changing uh, also because of the political context. Uh, so uh, 1960s and 70s, that's the time of the modern architecture in Warsaw, like here we can see the train station. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the side of this, let's say, modern developments, still in the 60s and especially 70s and 80s, once again, the decision was taken to rise from the ashes some of never reconstructed uh, monuments. And this was the case of the Royal Castle. In here, we can see an uh, image presenting the uh, ruins of the castle in the late 1960s. There was only an empty space, one gate and one part of the wall survived from what used to be a Royal Castle. It was 1971 uh, when the decision was taken to reconstruct the castle the same team with Jan Zachwatowicz and Stanisław Florenz uh, were leading uh, this project, project that was continued for about 13 years, and this is the final result. Uh, this is how the Royal Castle in Warsaw looks like uh, today. And here are the interiors, because what is important about this very project is that uh, the decision was taken also to reconstruct uh, interiors as they were before the war. Uh, using the uh, pre-war uh, iconography, pre-war measurements, and also reconstructing the furniture, bringing back uh, some uh, art pieces uh, from the pre-war era. And uh, finally, uh, maybe one information, this project ended actually two years ago. It was 2019 uh, when the uh, gardens of the Royal Castle were uh, open to the public, the lower garden, and this lower garden was reconstructed following the 1930s uh, pattern. Actually, it's a neo-baroque pattern following the 18th century pattern uh, that was uh, implemented there just before the World War II and then never reconstructed until 2019. So as you can see, the reconstruction of the city is an ongoing project. And uh, I could also say about some other projects uh, completed in the 70s, uh, completed in the 90s, uh, sometimes bringing a large of controversy, uh, this, this discussion about what we should reconstruct uh, still is a never ending one. And uh, until today, it is shaping to a certain extent, at least, the urban development of the city of Warsaw. Today, almost 2 million people uh, city, a very vibrant, very vivid uh, metropolia uh, with its new uh, city uh, scape uh, marked with this row of uh, skyscrapers. Uh, ending my presentation, I want to also say that uh, beside of Warsaw, there were some other cities, historic cities uh, left in ruins, uh, especially in the western part of the city uh, of Poland. 
uh, in the part of Poland that before the World War II uh, was a part of the Germany, was a part of Third Reich uh, and earlier on a part of the Germany. Um, after 1945, the uh, borders of Poland been moved. Uh, some part of Poland in the east was uh, joined to the Soviet Union. Some part of in the west that used to be a part of Germany was joined to Poland. And uh, what is important, this western part of Poland was really heavily uh, destroyed and damaged uh, in the spring of 1945, in the last months of the World War II. This was the case of the city of Gdańsk. Uh, in the times of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, this was the biggest city of Poland. And uh, uh, it, it, the city is marked with really outstanding uh, cultural heritage. Uh, one of the biggest Gothic churches of Europe uh, is in the city of Gdańsk. And what is important, uh, just like Warsaw, uh, this city was erased from the uh, surface in about 70%. So what we can see in this image is the so-called main town of Gdańsk that was uh, almost entirely reconstructed uh, in the 1950s and early uh, 60s. This is Gdańsk, and once again, that's the Green Gate in Gdańsk after the war and today. And that's the main square, the so-called Długi Targ uh, in Gdańsk today and after the war. And uh, here is the city of Poznań, uh, very important uh, Polish city in the Western part of our country. Uh, in February, 1945, demolished in about 55, 60%. That's the main square of Poznań after the war and main square of Poznań uh, today, uh, reconstructed following almost the same methodology as it was in uh, Warsaw. Uh, and uh, finally, the city of Wrocław, uh, before the war, very important German city called Breslau. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, defended by Nazi troops until May 1945, uh, unfortunately, this uh, defense was a reason of a, a total destruction, uh, more than 70% of the city gone. And here we can see an image of Wrocław just after the war and uh, of today. Uh, like Warsaw, like Poznań, like Gdańsk, reconstructed. Here is the town hall of Wrocław, uh, 45 and uh, and today. So as you can see, reconstruction of Warsaw uh, is something bigger. It's uh, a, uh, not only a reconstruction of one city, but it's a history of uh, some intellectual process. What to do with the ruined city? Uh, it is also um, um, like a vocabulary and dictionary about reconstruction that was implemented in many Polish cities uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, and still in the 70s. It is also an ongoing process. There are some discussion going on until today. Shall we restore some buildings that were left in ruins or shall we not? What are the extensions of reconstruction? And uh, uh, maybe my final uh, uh, word will be that uh, uh, this is the most important involvement of uh, Poland uh, for the urban planning and for the monument restoration uh, during the 20th century. Uh, this very kind of approach that even the city that was totally demolished can be rise again. But to do so, there should be a social background there should be a kind of a social environment wanting to uh, do so. And uh, this project uh, should be also a project of, let's say, social integration, uh, as it was in the city of Warsaw, the city that did not exist in 1945, that it was a big question mark if the city will be rise back. And uh, what is important, despite of a very difficult political conditions of the communist state as Poland was at that time, uh, reconstruction of Warsaw was a very positive um, project that uh, led the um, society of Warsaw uh, 
uh, resurrect uh, almost like a, a phoenix from ashes. Maybe I'm using uh, uh, two exaggerated words, but uh, I think that to a certain extent, the history of Warsaw can be presented in this very way. So sorry that I was uh, uh, very long. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate your patience and uh, I will be very happy to hear your questions to uh, start some discussion. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Mikhail Wisniewski. I think uh, that was absolutely brilliant. I mean, hearing you for more than an hour and you know, being totally engrossed uh, in what you're saying, I think that was uh, really something very outstanding. And even more outstanding is the fact that, you know, a city which had like more than eight, uh, 800,000 people dying, 85% of it being destroyed. And uh, yet uh, it's come up to be a city of the future. In fact, the Condé Nast Traveler magazine has rated Warsaw as the most colorful city in the world recently, in a very recent survey. So I think uh, I think this city, I mean, I'm, I'm in totally in love with the city. Uh, uh, the way it has uh, developed, the way it has been rebuilt and reconstructed is absolutely amazing. In fact, uh, uh, on a lighter note, the Palace of Culture and Science uh, is uh, such a landmark that whenever I'm in Warsaw and staying at the Intercontinental, I go to an office and when I have to come back, I actually walk it back to my hotel because I can see the Palace of Science and Culture or the Culture and Science from anywhere in Warsaw. You know, so uh, I think that's the thing. But for those of you who have never been there, I think uh, it's a place, it's a city which you must visit, Poland as a country you must visit. And... Uh, there is much to learn, much to learn about the resilience, the resilience and the, the ability of the people to you know, the withstand the damages and uh, rebuild themselves in such a manner. And I think the government also has played a very important role in you know, uh, developing this uh, uh, city, this country, and the, the development and the growth still continues. And I am sure that we will see many wonderful things uh, in Warsaw and other cities of Poland. So with this, uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts in this because I was so engrossed listening to Dr. Mikhail and that uh, I thought see, maybe I should uh, share this. So now we will open this up to question answer sessions. We have about 10 minutes to spare. So if anybody would like to ask the question, you could just unmute yourself and uh, uh, ask the question. Or if you want to put it on the chat box, I can uh, ask the question for you, whatever works. Thank you. GM, you want to start with the question? I think there are some questions in the chat box already, so maybe you can start with them. Okay, just okay. Let me just uh, have a look at them. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Mikhail, there's one question. Uh, one, there are a lot of questions actually. Sorry. No, many comments, but some questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to see the question. Uh, I see them. You can uh, see them? Okay. Yeah, I, I see a, a comment about, uh, in spite of being a socialist country, the leaders decided to restore the historical monuments uh, on a nationalistic basis and with utmost respect to tradition. Uh, well, uh, actually, I should, uh, I should uh, develop this uh, issue. Uh, uh, well, uh, communists in Poland, uh, they were not respected by the society. And uh, after the World War II, there was a kind of a civil war going on in my country. Uh, and and uh, communists, they were running a very brutal policy to get control over the uh, territory of Poland, over the society, over the economy. And uh, to um, find some kind of legitimacy among the society, uh, they decided to implement such projects uh, to present that the pre-war Poland, the so-called capitalistic Poland, was the one that was responsible for the war and for the destruction. And we are the new uh, authorities that are responsible for the reconstruction. So uh, it was a very clever, uh, very clever political idea. However, this idea uh, was uh, uh, really uh, appreciated by 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 <clears throat> majority of the uh, society. Uh, so uh, the political context was a very difficult, but in some cases, paradoxically, uh, it gave a very positive result. Thank you, Dr. Mikhail. If you could just close your screen so that you know we can have a larger screen of this. 
there was another question from Mr. Prasanth Rai, who, whom I know very well for many years. Uh, he had a question, surprised how fund mobilized for reconstruction. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, there was a question, surprised yeah. how fund mobilized for reconstruction. Uh, well, um, what can I say? Uh, uh, you should understand one thing. Before the World War II, uh, on the territory of Poland, there was about 36 million of inhabitants, almost like today. After the war in 1945, there was only 24. Uh, about 6 million people died, uh, were killed. A uh, few millions were left in the Soviet Union and still waiting for let's say, uh, transport to, to Poland. And um, uh, it was extremely important to find some way to uh, reconciliate the society, uh, to give some positive, uh, positive uh, uh, ideas, to give some ideas that will link, that will glue the society again. The society that was traumatized, uh, that, uh, Almost everyone had someone to, who died, who was killed. Almost everyone uh, was involved in some uh, war events. And um, uh, such a positive project uh, was extremely important. Uh, and um, uh, also it was a project about uh, uh, our identity, who actually we are, uh, who actually, what is actually our uh, past. Uh, in many ways, it was manipulated by the communists. Uh, for instance, the fact that the royal castle was reconstructed so late uh, in the 70s, and there was no space for this reconstruction earlier. Uh, it was a kind of a play with the society, but uh, it was something really needed and uh, something that found a very positive um, answer from the very beginning. If you go to the books, uh, to the diaries of some intellectuals, sometimes very anti-communist, uh, books and diaries from the 50s, uh, you can find from time to time uh, information that, however, everything is wrong <laughs> about our country, everything is wrong about the political system. There is one positive thing, and this is the <laughs> reconstruction of Warsaw. I don't know if I answered the question. So uh, for the brevity of time, we will just, uh, I will just want to ask you one more question because I, before I request uh, Jan Tezovieski to uh, give his concluding remarks, uh, there's a question about a reconstruction of the Royal Castle was beautiful. Where did the paintings come from? Uh, well, uh, before the war, uh, many art pieces been taken away from the castle, hidden in various places. Uh, of course, uh, many art pieces uh, from the places like this one have uh, been also uh, uh, transported to Germany. And after the war, uh, if only it was possible, if they were not destroyed, they were uh, taken back uh, to, uh, to Poland. Uh, one of the thrones of uh, Polish king uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are presented in the castle uh, is uh, decorated, it's, it's, it's back, is decorated with the uh, silver eagles. Eagle is a symbol of Poland. And uh, only one uh, such eagle, one or two survived. And uh, it was uh, possible to reconstruct the other ones. Uh, so there were a mixture of technologies, uh, how to deal with that. Canaletto's painting uh, survived. Uh, so they are presented in the castle um, today. Uh, there were also some art donators, uh, like for instance, Landskoroński family, Polish aristocratic family. In the 19th century, uh, they gathered a huge artistic collection and uh, this collection after the war uh, was in the West of Europe. Uh, in 1990s, they decided to donate their collection to Royal Castle in Krakow <laughs> and to Royal Castle in uh, Warsaw. So, for instance, in Warsaw right now, there are two portraits painted by uh, Rembrandt, Rembrandt Manrini, and uh, they are coming from this very collection. 
so in some cases you have paintings from the other places but uh, filling the gaps of uh, paintings that used to be there and we know that they were there and they are representing the same era the same epoch the same uh, themes uh, in some cases there were opportunities to bring back uh, the art pieces hidden or uh, found uh, after the war, for instance, in, uh, in Germany. And maybe one more information. Uh, there is quite controversial uh, topic dedicated to reconstruction. After the war in the Western part of Poland, the part of Poland that used to be a part of Germany, uh, some of the palaces of the German uh, aristocracy, um, uh, especially uh, those that were destroyed during the fights of 1945, uh, they were not reconstructed and uh, art pieces, especially the stoneworks from these palaces, they've been moved to Warsaw uh, to be used for the sake of reconstruction. Not necessarily Warsaw, but especially to Warsaw. Um, so, uh, as you can see, it was a very mixture of ideas how to find the material and how to find the art pieces. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mikhail, once again. I am trying to figure out how to put this uh, 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 Is it possible for you to remove this uh, screen the, uh, in the middle so that uh, everybody side by side? Stop screen share. Uh, stop screen share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think something. Ah, okay. Uh, of course. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, now we will just, uh, sorry, what happened? We all there. Yeah, so I, I would, uh, uh, yeah, this is what I wanted. So I would basically now like to invite uh, Jan Tisiewiecki, the chief expert at the uh, Department of International Relations, Ministry of Culture and National Heritage uh, in Warsaw, Poland. But before I uh, request him to say a few words, I must add that this uh, webinar was possible because of him. I had the privilege of meeting him, uh, I think about a year and a half back in Warsaw when I was introduced to, there by my good friend, uh, his also good friend, Christoph Papitko, who is with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so we were discussing and this, uh, because of this pandemic, we were all stuck and uh, we said we must do something. So I said, let's do online something and so, I chased the uh, GM and I chased uh, Jan to uh, get something done. And, you know, we have this together. And of course, uh, the international, uh, 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 the center at the Krakow, they, I hope that with this, we will have many more interactions with, interact, uh, with uh, <coughs> others uh, in India. And uh, thankfully the ambassador was here. So we, we, uh, we hope that uh, this would be a good starting point. Sorry, so may I now request Jan Tisaviaski to say a few words, give the concluding remarks before I give a, a kind of a formal vote of thanks. I've already thanked a lot of people already, but I can do that again. Jan, can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jaydeep. Uh, it's been a wonderful work uh, of you to prepare uh, it. Uh, to, to meet two nations, uh, such a group of wonderful people. And uh, most of all, thanks to, to uh, Mr. Dr. Michał Wisniewski, with whom I, I've been cooperating for uh, about 15 years. And uh, his presentation was really um, amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, on one side, concise, but on the other hand, uh, really impressing with the, all the images and research. And um, I think nothing uh, was left to talk, uh, to, to uh, present to you about you know, this specific issue of rebuilding Warsaw as a scheme for rebuilding some other parts of Poland. Uh, all the um, theories on what to rebuild and what not to rebuild. And um, I think this is sometimes really um, added value when somebody sees, this, sees a topic and issue from a distance. So uh, Dr. Wisniewski uh, is working in Krakow and he has a beautiful <laughs> sight from the window. Um, and in fact, uh, it gives a um, fresher uh, reflection on what, what has happened. So 
So it was something perfect. Really appreciate that and hope uh, we can return and maybe uh, amplify this topic. I, I also um, appreciate and I'm really touched with the reaction of our uh, friends, colleagues from uh, Intact Chapter Calcutta and everybody else who joined us. Uh, it's really amazing to see, uh, even from your faces, but uh, also on the chat, how, how you were um, emotionally entering this topic. And uh, I hope the pandemic is over and you can come to Warsaw, see it uh, and touch it, smell it, <laughs> whatever. And you can also um, visit our ministry. Uh, actually, I'm talking from a um, rebuilt palace, uh, Czartoryski Potowski Palace which is uh, just a few steps from the main square, from, from the uh, old core of Warsaw. So um, please come once you can to, to Warsaw. And uh, I, I hope this is, um, uh, I not hope, it's in fact, that that's a pilot edition of, of uh, Polish Kolkata, Polish Indian cooperation. Uh, and uh, with the crucial input of, of Mr. Uh, Joy Deproy, who in fact um, resuscitated the cooperation in the times of pandem pandemic. We are exchanging thoughts and ideas for future cooperations. In fact, there are uh, already some projects to, to talk about <laughs> in a very uh, close future. <laughs> and um, what is important to begin with is, is to having two partners or three partners, but a base for this cooperation, which is uh, what uh, Dr. Wisniewski mentioned at the beginning, um, the strategic cooperation between uh, International Cultural Center in uh, Krakow and INTAC India. Uh, this is a, a base which worked for today and hopefully will be working for, uh, for tomorrow, next year's, next centuries. And uh, it will bridge, it will be like basis for uh, any activities because uh, International Cultural Center, which uh, um, humbly um, Dr. Wisniewski hasn't mentioned uh, what, what his institution is and how important it is and, uh, and the highest level of expertise they have and also openness to, uh, to any groups of people uh, from you know, Krakow, Poland and abroad. And so they are very versatile. They are located in the main square of, of Krakow, inviting um, exhibitions, presentations from abroad. And skipping all other activities, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Wisniewski is heading Academy of, of Heritage, which is um, kind of, uh, can we call it school or university uh, for anybody that wants to deepen expertise, uh, learn more on uh, management of, of cultural heritage uh, with the special um, emphasis on, on UNESCO sites. Um, so another thing to, to take a note of. And um, as for my Ministry of Culture, uh, just not entering much into details how, how uh, the cultural management system is working in Poland, but basically we have statal, uh, institutions, activities, uh, and local ones on the level of regions called ships and, and uh, local communities. And we have private, and, uh, private entities. So uh, basically, um, since this division, uh, ministry supervising and uh, subsidizing the most important institution for the national culture, uh, like, like the, the uh, ICC of, of Mr. Uh, Michał. And um, what we have, um, we are coordinating all the uh, cultural education, starting from the elementary uh, musical schools uh, up to uh, art universities, so music universities and um, art universities and so on and so on. And um, among, in the core of the system, we have uh, so-called the center of competencies. So there are national institutions that coordinate a specific um, issue, topic, uh, domain of culture. So, uh, International Cultural Center is, is a center of competence for the uh, for um, the debate and research on cultural heritage. We have a um, music institute, music and dance institute. We have uh, 
Museology Institute, and so so these are the partners for future cooperations. And uh, my department, Department of International Relations, is uh, like cardinal for um, cultural cooperations. Uh, what, what means cardinal? It comes from cardines uh, in Latin. So we are the hinge, like hinge in the door. We uh, we are delivered with a signal, with an interest, and we just turn to the best institutions to uh, to bridge, to build a bridge, to to uh, establish ties, and to think how uh, cooperation can be operative. And uh, just the last thing to, to um, mention is that uh, Poland and Lidia have a culture agreement, which is about to be uh, renewed completely. So um, we can think also of inserting um, specific projects into our uh, legal uh, basis between our countries. So um, thank you very much once again, Joy Deep, uh, for, for this possibility to, to meet in such a wonderful uh, uh, with such a wonderful team uh, of yours, your colleagues. Um, I really appreciate that. I really uh, love uh, cooperation with India. Always Indian partners are at the uh, highest intellectual level. And I, I learn a lot from them. Mm, and uh, in fact, the first big step leap forward has been done. I leave the floor to you, hoping to meet uh, soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. That was really wonderful. And I think you shared a lot of very important information about what more can be done, how it can be done. So I think we are going to uh, uh, look into that and you know plan things as we go forward. Uh, so if I may just quickly propose a vote of thanks, which is the last part of the thing. But uh, you know, generally, it's the very boring part, and people tend to uh, look the other way. But I would start by thanking His Excellency, the Ambassador of uh, Poland to India, uh, uh, who has been very kind to, uh, you know, share his opening remarks and bless this uh, uh, program, which is very important for us because in India and uh, this uh, relationship between Poland and India has been growing uh, uh, very strongly over the years. And as uh, Jan just pointed out that, you know, the cultural diplomacy between Poland and India, there is already an MOU which has signed. So there's a lot of projects which can be done. So I, I am sure that his Excellency's blessings and uh, involvement will be there to take things forward. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Mikhail Wisniewski for once again for uh, such an amazing presentation. I mean, I am at a loss for words to say. I mean, GME will agree he are a more of a man of this uh, subject, but uh, for me, who's been a layman, but who has seen Warsaw and who has seen Poland so closely, the way you have explained the uh, change, the reconstruction, the rebuilding of Warsaw. I mean, that has been uh, truly, uh, it's, it's been a learning experience, actually. I mean, for all of us who's been present here, and I really thank you for it, for taking your time out. Uh, GM, thank you once again for uh, using, uh, allowing us to use your platform, Intact, to organize this program. I think it has gone, uh, it has been uh, really presented well by Dr. Uh, Dr. Mikhail and uh, we are really thankful to you for this opportunity. I, I would also like to thank the participants who have joined in from Intech, from elsewhere, and my friends who are invited to come in and uh, join this session. Uh, my thanks to all my friends from Poland, uh, uh, Jinkwe Barjo. And uh, I'm sorry I could not mention all of you, but I think I saw Karina, I saw Daria, and I, uh, Mr. JJ Singh from the Indopolis Chamber of Commerce was also here. We had Mr. Uh, uh, Raghu, who is the Honorary Consul of Poland to India uh, in Bangalore. And we had a host of other people, Mr. Roy, Mr. Rajiv Lochan from Coal India. So I would like to thank all of you for joining in, all of you for present, uh, sharing mm -hmm. your time. And um, we are sorry that we could not answer all the questions in the chat, but it has been noted and I will try and coordinate with GM and get those answered uh, through Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Wisniewski over the email and send to you. And uh, with these few words, I am late by two minutes, but uh, I would again like to thank all of you for joining in and hope you enjoyed this session, uh, had a great learning and you will uh, make Poland a place to visit or, or on your to-do list or travel list next time you're going to Europe. Thank you so much for all of you for joining in. Thank you. Absolutely.
No, no, I said, uh, as you said rightly, Poland is immediately on my to-do list. And uh, I've never visited. And uh, the, the, what uh, Dr. Mikhail has said is really uh, evoked a lot of interest as far as uh, we conservationists and enthusiasts in heritage are concerned. Mm. We'd love to visit. That is... Yes. Uh, Definitely on the to-do list now. In fact, uh, GM, what you need to do is also we can always plan a, once things improve, we can always plan a trip to think on the art and cultural lines and, you know, uh, uh, Jan is there. And uh, Dr. Mikhail, by the way, I've never been inside the Wawel Castle in Krakow. So I, yeah, and your, <laughs> the, the, your room was fantastic. That would be a very nice thing to do, Joydeep. I will do that. Yeah, that would be a very nice thing to do. Yes, 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 I will do that. <laughs> and so that is one of the things. But again, Krakow is very beautiful. I mean, you know, so that is one place I would like to visit. But uh, GM, we must plan and do that, you know. So plan a trip and, you know, organize a program so that, you know, it becomes... Uh, uh, it can become a cultural activity, basically. Yes, 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 and yes, a learning yes, yes. activity for all of us, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we must do that. We must do that. Thank so you. Ladies, very uh, beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, Dr. Mikhail, uh, GM, uh, Rian. Everybody else for joining in. Thank and you. Have a great day ahead and uh, be awesome. Be great. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.